Hey, welcome to our brand new series called Seed Stage. This is our finance series where we're taking it all the way back to seed stage, really focusing on how the finance that we have is seed that God can use. As we begin to sow it, we're gonna to begin to see blessing in our world. And I know you're gonna be blessed as a result of this sermon. So dig in and enjoy. We're in week two of our brand new series called Seed Stage. Let me remind you, this is not a finance series. It's a freedom series. We're getting free in the area of our finances. And if we unlock this area, it's amazing what God can do in and through our life. But let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. says, He, being God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Verse 12, for the ministry, everyone say ministry, of the service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. In week one of the series, we identified that we have all been well supplied and we differentiated between what is seed and what is feed. Today, I wanna dig in a little bit, press in on this a little more. And I wanna speak to you today from the subject, provided with potential provided with potential. You all ready for the Word of God? All right, find five of your favorite people in your immediate vicinity and give them some kind of love. Would you show them some kind of love? Show them, show them a fist bump, a handshake, a high five, whatever is appropriate to the level of your relationship. Go ahead and have an interaction of some sort. Amen. So I have been... Uh, Training our girls, you know this, I've mentioned this, training our daughters, two of our daughters, our twins, how to drive. It's been back to driving instructor training season, and I've been successful at getting their licenses, but the whole process of driver training is fascinating because these days, and for those, those dads that don't yet have kids that are driving and you've yet to go this process, something that I might make you aware of is it's not just teaching them how to steer a vehicle, turn a vehicle on and use the elements of the vehicle. You, ask, you actually have to teach them how to navigate as well. This is, it's like this, is, this is another tool that we often forget about because it's so automatic having a GPS. And so we've been training them how to program the navigation system and how to follow the navigation system, not just because that ain't always gonna be there to say, turn right now, stop. You know what I mean? Like th there's gonna have to be some instructions. And, and we were talking about it the other day as we are programming it in. I said, you don't even know how easy you got it. Because the GPS hasn't always been around. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, back in the day, we had to have a book of maps and that you had to like pre-plan your route. And I, as an electrician, I was telling him I had to pre-plan the night before all the different places I had to go to, the different jobs, the sites. I had to plan out the freeways, the highways, the side streets, the back streets, the, the counter plans. And then because if you had like an old map and streets were updated, there was no map at all. You had to like phone the customer and just get the directions and hand, right? You had to have a plan. Now you don't have to be planned at all. You just punch it in. It gives you the fastest route. It gives you the shortcut. But back in the day, we had to have a plan and you had to learn how to pivot on the plan. You know, if the customer wasn't home, where are you gonna go now and how are you gonna get there? In fact, I was telling them a story. It just went from that to a story about when I was an electrician and we had, we had plans. We had to follow plans uh, when we were doing installations. And I had a, had a boss. I was an apprentice. We had another apprentice who was a little bit younger, earlier stage apprentice than me. And my boss would do illegal things where he would just, he would go and take us because this was, it's illegal. You can't just leave an apprentice unsupervised on a job site. But he made extra money if he was at another job and he put us at a job. And, and so he would take us there and he gave us the plans. He said, just follow the plan, you'll be fine. And so we'd be at this job site and we'd look at the plans and we'd go to work. And we were at this one mega place one time and we had to put in like some hundreds of these down lights in, in, in this building according to the plan. And so I looked at the plan and the other apprentice, he was looking at the plan and I'm reading the plan. He's across from me reading the plan. And I said, I'm gonna take this section. He's like, okay. And he's like, you, I said, you take that section. He's like, okay. So we go to work. For a few hours, we go to work according to the plan. Well, 
when I came to look at his work, it wasn't according to the plan. He had put about 50 downlights in the wrong place. And I was like, bro, what happened to the plan? And he's like, I, I was looking at the plan. I said, come and show me on the plan where that resembles that. And he came around to my side of the plan and he's like, oh, I see from this side. He was looking at the right plan, but the wrong way. You thought that was bad. You should have seen how our boss reacted. We got fired. Literally, both of us got fired that day. And uh, he said to me, so what's the plan? I said, I don't know about you, but I'm starting my own business, bro. See you later. You have to have a plan. How many people know you have to have a plan? You've got to have a plan in life. In fact, there, there is, this might be, I don't know if this is be challenging. Maybe I could ask this. How many people are planned? You, you would say you're a planned person. You're a planner in life. Please, please raise your hand. Please be involved in the church service today. Okay, and how many people would say you're more spontaneous? You, you kind of like to just go with it. Isn't it funny how... Marriages are divided right now. <laughs> Honestly, both have their advantages and their disadvantages. You see, the, the planner always creates a sense of security and structure around them because they're providing a clear pathway for, for people to align with and walk on. However, the, on the other hand, the, the spontaneous person who, who likes to stay more fluid in life when when plans change or when things don't go to plan, they, they actually have the ability to pivot with ease and, and create a new pathway quite frictionless. Now, now, the truth is planning is not only an important part of life. Believe it or not, it is a deeply spiritual practice because it requires both discipline and the consideration of others. As they taught me in seminary, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Now, now what what actually might be comforting revelation for you today, especially for those that actually struggle with uncertainty around the future and what God has for you, I want you to know this, and maybe this is gonna be helpful to write down. God has a plan. It's simple, but it's gonna be profound for you to know that God has a plan. In all your plans or lack of plans, Regardless of how planned or unplanned you are, I want to let you know from the pulpit that God has a plan. In fact, the truth is he's had a plan from the very beginning. And not only has he had a plan, but that plan is still in play because unlike our plans, God's plans don't change. We see this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when it comes to God's plans, Scripture makes it real plain. Well, let me show you this. As, as we see in Isaiah chapter 46, verse nine, it says, remember the things I have done in the past for I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass for I do whatever I wish. That's, that's God. That his plans will come to pass. He does whatever he Wants. In fact, God, not only does God have a plan, but he has plans. He, he got plans for nations. He got plans for, for people groups. He got plans for churches. He's got plans for individuals. He's got a plan for this church. Actually, the church is God's plan. Can I just put it real plain? It was God's idea. It, it was what Jesus came to establish from Ministry, we see that he came to establish and found the church and he has caused us to continue what it is that he began. And all of this is very important to know so that we firmly understand that God's plan is not reactionary, it's preemptive. God, God's plans aren't pivoted. God's not pivoting on the plans because you did something unpredictable that God wasn't expecting. No, 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 God's plan is prescriptive and preemptive because God's in control. You see, God has plans on plans with the overarching plan being that every human would actually come to know him and accept his salvation. That, that's the plan. That, that we would fellowship with God. That's part of his plan. That we would not only know 
and discover the good works that he has for us, but we would also experience the expanse of his love for us. It's what the Apostle Paul says, and he lays out in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He says, for we are his workmanship, created Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In fact, can I just go a little philosophical on you this morning? I'm trying to preach some truth to get us warmed up, but I do want to kind of tap into the philosophical element of our thinking and make sure we process God's plans well, because part of God's plan is that we would actually discover his plan. (laughs) God's got a plan that you'd learn his plan. He's got a plan for you. Let me give you a classic scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, that God has a plan for you. In fact, actually, let me, let me read it properly for you because it doesn't just tell us that God has a plan. It also reveals what his plan is concerning us. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. How many, how many people would agree that this is a good plan? This is an inspiring plan. But I wonder, what's God's plan to fulfill that plan? And, and, and how can I be certain that what I'm doing right now is fulfilling God's plan? What I'm doing in life on a day-to-day, am I actually contributing to fulfilling God's, God's plan? Well, as we discovered last week with the seed bag and from our series scripture, God actually provides us with everything we need to fulfill His plan. Can I quickly remind us what the scripture says? It says in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, that seed and feed, will supply and multiply. You see that word there? Multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, if you haven't noticed this about a characteristic of Jesus is that, 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 that he is into multiplication. Like he's really into it. It's like one of his favorite things to do. Jesus loves to multiply. We, we see it last week with the loaves and, and the fish. Uh, you'll actually find also that at the wedding of Cana, Jesus multiplied the amount of wine. Uh, also with Peter, he multiplied his catch. It's kind of a thing that Jesus does. It's like one of his characteristics. You see multiplication, you're like, oh, that Jesus has been here. It's like there's more than there was before. Jesus has been here. It's like a trademark of Jesus. It's like a characteristic of Jesus. Jesus loves to multiply. He loves to take what we see as limited. It says, watch when I put my power upon it. It multiplies. It doesn't divide, it multiplies. That's important for you to know. God doesn't divide, he multiplies. Because if he just simply took something and divided it, you would have lesser versions of that same thing. But he doesn't divide, he multiplies that thing. He makes more of that thing. It's important to know about the way God Works And not only that, the Bible reveals that good management is measured in your ability to multiply what you've been given. Did you catch that? That the measure of good management is in your ability to multiply what you've been given. I think the front row caught it, but I don't know if it made it beyond the front row. Is this on? We, yeah. You, The Bible makes it very clear that if you are to be a good manager, to manage what you've been given is not measured in keeping what you've been given, but multiplying what you've been given. To to literally have the characteristic and the nature of Jesus operating, because remember Jesus is in the multiplication. So, so, So be like Jesus, be like Christ, and begin to multiply what you've been given. That's the measure of good management. That's what we see with the parable of the talents. When the servants came back, just with what they were given, I buried it, looked after it, I protected it. Guess what? It, I know in earthly settings, if we came back with what we were given, we didn't lose it, especially in this economy, especially in this stock market, especially in the, in the nature of what God's got going on. Man, in, in the world, man, if I just bring back what I've given, I didn't lose any of it. You didn't lose, you, you didn't gain, but you didn't lose. And then we would say, hey, you managed that well. But in the kingdom of God, that's not considered good management. That person is considered a wicked and lazy servant. 
Good management in the kingdom comes with multiplication. That what I was given, I put it to work and I bring, bring back an increase. An increase. I increased what was, what was given. This is because God not only gives you what you need for today, He also provides you with seed for what's coming. I, I'd understand if your management was based on just existing, if God's plan for you was just to survive, then Scripture would reiterate that God gives you enough for today. That, that's why we couldn't exist on manna. It was enough for the day. Couldn't store it, couldn't hoard it, couldn't hold it, couldn't keep it, couldn't trade it. That, that was for then, but under the new covenant, God doesn't just give us enough for today. He gives us seed for tomorrow. That if we would actually be part of God's plan, not just recipients of God's plan, but as part of God's plan, we would actually put the seed to work. Actually, a really good way to discover what God's got planned for you is actually to assess what He's already given you. If you, if you ever want to know what it is that God's got planned for you, I don't know if you've ever asked that question. I don't know if you've ever like kind of considered that, like what has God called me to do in life and what's, what's, what's God got for me? What's His plan for my life specifically? Well, a good place to start is to look at what you got. So the way God works. He, he kind of, God's mysterious. He, he, likes to, he likes to be sought. He has promises that if you seek, you'll find. If you're not, the door will be opened. God just likes to do this because He likes to be pursued. He, he likes an engagement. He's got mysteries, not so that we would never find Him, but just so that we would seek Him. Because God works in revelation, that when you seek, you actually find, and you get the revelation, this is what God's called me to do. So what God does, He'll give you things that you don't even know you've got until you begin to look. And when you begin to assess what you've got, you begin to get a realization, a revelation that maybe this is part of God's plan, is to use the things that He's given me to do. That's, that's what 2 Corinthians reveals, reveals that God gives us seed. Another way, to say it is he provides you with potential. So to get an indication of what the potential is on my life and what God wants to do in and through me, I should assess the seed that he's already given. For example, God gives us spiritual gifts. And when it comes to the gifts from God, they always come in seed form. If you're trying to look in your life for a fully developed gift, look again. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, if God gave us a fully fledged gift, like it's already in operation, like it's a magnificent gift, like the first moment we use that spiritual gift, like maybe it's a gift of prophecy, and we're just like, man, we're just reading mail. We're just unpacking people's history, future, things that nobody knows about them and that nobody dares know, but they know, and then you say it, and then the power of God comes over them, they get transformed right in that moment. Like you've never given a prophetic word before, but it's like, bam. Bam. Or maybe it's a healing gift where you've never ever stepped out in healing, but you just decide today's the day you lay hands on someone and they get out of a wheelchair or they get out of the hospital or something massive happens. It doesn't work like that because the gift comes in seed form. It comes with an idea, maybe I should encourage somebody. But as you begin to step out and speak encouragement or exhortation, what you begin to realize is that God grows that seed and it produces fruit, and it becomes a fully developed gift. But it always starts in seed form. God gives it in seed form. In fact, that's what seed does, is seed represents potential. Not only does a single seed actually hold unlimited potential, it also remains as potential while it remains as seed. <laughs> what I mean is, Seed has an incredible ability to remain dormant, even for decades, but still retain the power of potential. I, I, I came across an article that, uh, the, the article was called Prehistoric Seed, and it caught my attention because uh, I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is interesting. Uh, and, and, and it was talking about the fact that in Masada, they, they had uncovered buried clay pots that had seed still in it, that had been preserved for centuries, and they took this seed and they planted this seed and it produced these kind of ancient date palms that they thought were extinct, that they thought weren't any around anymore. And as they planted this centuries old seed, it's, it actually produced date palms. And it's crazy because it was centuries years old, that it had lasted dormant 
for centuries with all the potential. The potential to produce dates, the potential to produce fruit. But, but while it was still in the seed stage, it was dormant. It's not until it's sown in the soil that it produces the potential. And you might look at the seed and go, wow, that's some cool seed. You know what's way cooler than seed is the fruit, <laughs> is the plant, is what it produces. But so much of us are just still sitting in the seed stage and not in the produce stage. Sitting dormant on what God's given us, but hoarding it and holding it, not releasing it so they can actually produce what the potential is intended to produce. You see, a fun fact, and I'll give you a fun fact because I've been dabbling in the venture capital world and I know a little thing or two now. And what you might need to know if you're a founder, if you're starting, is that the seed round funding is pretty exciting because your whole seed round funding is actually raised on potential. Just the potential of something. It's crazy. You don't even have to have a product. Haven't have to prove in anything. Just a potential. You can raise money on a potential. You can get funded off potential. It's a crazy world we live in. But just the potential. Later stage funding, you have to have performance. But at the beginning, you have to have potential because potential speaks about what's to come. And potential is exciting. But there has to be a point where potential becomes performance. Where, where, where the potential has to become realistic, where it has to be realized. It can't stay potential forever because while a seed can stay dormant, it won't produce the fruit that it's intended while it stays at a seed stage. Now, allow me to help define some things when it comes to God's plans because they're, they're most often outworked through God's promises. And, and not just God's promises, there's two avenues that God works through. He works through His promises and biblical principles. I want to unpack this for you because this is going to be helpful to understand how do I take it from seed or potential to fruit in my life. And to know the difference is important because they're most often mixed up. You see, the promises of God are God's guarantee, where principles actually hold all the potential. Let me explain it because you'll see with the promises and the principles, there you're going to find that they actually both established by God. However, there is a difference. God's promises are unfailing and completed by his own divine nature. For instance, take Abraham. He's a great example of God's promises. He had the promise that he would become the father of many nations, yet he didn't even have a son. He himself was old and his wife's womb was barren. But, but none of these elements or hurdles or obstacles could prevent God's promises from coming to pass, not even a dead womb. If God speaks it, it will come to pass. If God promises it, not even something that's dead can prevent God's promise because God will just raise it. So that's how the promises of God, He is faithful to His promise. Principles are similar. However, principles require our participation. They actually require something from us. However, before I tell you what they require, I, I thought maybe I could tell you what a principle is. I'm not going to assume we all know what the principles of God are, but, but, but maybe because last week I gave you six pillars for financial success, I, I could maybe give you six principles that you could live by today. Just for all the note takers here, for all the planners in the room, I'll give you six biblical principles. The first one I want to give you is live above and beyond. Would you write that down? Live above and beyond. Matthew 5.41 says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. <laughs> That's Jesus. This is also known as having a second mile mentality and will position you to always provide more value than what's required. That's what Jesus was. He said, here's a principle for life. Go above and beyond. If someone's expecting the bare minimum, go further. Don't, don't just operate in the world like a bare minimum mentality. Go second mile mentality. If someone's asking you to deliver on a project, deliver early. Deliver better than expected. Provide more value. Number two principle is keep the golden rule. Luke 6.31 says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Jesus makes this one so clear. How you treat others is how you can expect to be treated. I love these simple truths. I love how basic principles are. They're almost shocking. 
that when you, when you look at a principle, it almost seems too easy, and then you begin to wonder, well, why aren't I doing it? I, I know I'm meant to treat others the way I want to be treated, but I don't. Not on the 101. <laughs> All right, not impressed with the golden rule. Okay, let's go to, let's go to principle number three. Say what you mean. I love how Jesus reiterates this, Matthew 5, 37, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Just say yes or say no. Don't, don't, don't keep people like on red, like just waiting. Man, we've got an epidemic in our culture where people just say, hey, you're gonna come to this thing and you're like, oh, well, maybe, let me see, I'll get back to you. Just say no. Like, what are you worried about? Disappointing them? No, you're disappointing them as it is. Just say no. Can't make it. Cool. I'll stop hassling you. You have to have some, like, really cool excuse. You know, it's like, oh, I got to uh, you do this thing and, and, and that. It's like, no, you don't. Now, now you're adding lying into it. <laughs> Just be like, no. And they say, why? Because Matthew 537 <laughs> says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. <laughs> be direct. Don't mislead. You've got to tell the truth at all costs. Number, number four, order is imperative. Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. It's always God first and everything else after that. That's a biblical principle. Number five, direct your finances or your finances will direct you. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. That means invest wisely. Invest wisely. I, I want to speak to all the investors. Invest wisely. Don't just invest in things that will create gains because where you actually invest, your heart will be connected. You've got to be mindful of what you connect your heart to. There's going to be many things that will get a quick gain, but do you want your heart connected to that product? Do you want your heart connected to that company, that organization? I'm just a little pastoral advice. Invest Invest wisely. Number six, what you sow, you reap. I know these are basic, but 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I feel like I'm giving you all the classic Bible verses today. I'm not even giving you anything you haven't heard before, but they're basic biblical principles that if you actually apply them to your life, they will produce fruit. Did you hear that? If you apply them to your life, they will produce fruit. Fruit principles are like seed. Principle is a potential that if applied, in other words, to make these principles have an effect in my life, I have to put them into practice. You see, a principle is a fundamental truth that produces a divine system of cooperation between heaven and humanity. Let me, read, let me say that again. A principle is a fundamental truth that produces a divine system of cooperation between heaven and humanity. A, a promise is God's doing. A principle is my participation. <laughs> In fact, this is what makes us good stewards, is one who lives by principles. Now, now that's the difference here between a, a promise and a principle, is for, for a principle to come to pass, God's looking for our participation. Both, do you know both promises... Uh, and, and, and principles require belief. It's just that one requires revelation, the other one requires application. When it comes to the promise of God, I've just got to get the revelation, God's going to do it, and I put my trust in Him. I apply my faith. I, I don't lose confidence. I, I stay in faith. I don't go into fear. If God said it, I'm going to every day believe it, that He's going to make it happen. If God's spoken, it's a promise, I'm going to stand on that. I'm not going to cower. I'm not going to lose all my, my stuff. I'm not going to get worried and frantic. Oh, no, I don't know what God's promised. No, I know what God's promised. So even though I don't see it, I'm standing firm on the promise. But guess what? You don't stand on a principle. You apply a principle. You don't just stand on a principle. You, you apply a principle. You live a principle. You, you act on the principle. You, you have an application element to your life. Let, let, me, let me close out with a story from Scripture because in Genesis 22, we have look Abraham, who actually is pretty happy with his promise, by the way. Remember Abraham? He's the guy who got 
the promised son. He was meant to be the father of many nations. And, and yet he didn't have a son, had an old wife and barren womb. And there was no way that he could make it happen, but God still promised. And so what Abraham did is he did what we're meant to do with a promise. He stood on the promise. He stood firm in the fact that if God said it, he'll do it. And then we see that the promise came to pass. And now you've got Abraham who's pretty pumped about his promise. Could you imagine how pumped you would be? I mean, I know, I know fathers when they just get like one kid and, and, they get, and they're like so excited and they're like 28 years old. But, but like when you're 100 years old and you've been waiting on that promise, you're pretty pumped with that promise. And he's so excited about the promise. However, what you'll find is that God is just as interested in us living out His principles as He is in us experiencing His promises. Because while there is a lot that God does for us, His plan is actually that we would participate. Like there's a lot that God does for us, but there's so much more that God wants to do through us. And for Him to do through us, it requires our participation. And so check this out. We've got Genesis and you got Abraham. He's pretty pumped about the promise. And then it says this, in Genesis 22, verse one. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. He said, here I am. I love the conversation. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to Lena Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Now, let me pause here because I'm not sure what you expected the response here should be from Abraham, but Abraham's on a whole nother level because he doesn't say, hey, God, are you sure? He doesn't say, God, I'm, I'm not really confident if I'm hearing you right. He doesn't even say, I think I had some bad curry last night. It could be that. No, he's just like, okay. He just says, okay. Verse three, so Abraham rose early. In the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and, and the boy and I will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his son, sorry, his hand, the fire and the knife and so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, we got them, but, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went on together. What you might have missed, and you might know the story is that right at the last minute, God provides. Right at the last minute, God provides. But it was at the last minute that God provided, but the principle is said right here. The principle that Abraham was living by was God will provide. But he still had to apply the principle in order for God to, he had to be prepared to, sow the seed that God gave him. He gave him a son and God said, oh, oh you thought that was, that was it? No, that was the seed. Would you bring the seed? That's your first son. It's like your, your tithe, that's your first, tenth. Would you bring the first back to me and, and watch as you give it to me, I'm gonna provide. But you're looking at the seed going, oh God, I don't know if you're gonna provide seed like this. This seed's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with this seed. I'm pretty stoked with this new role I got, this new job, and I love the paycheck. But, but God, I don't, I'm not so sure. I mean, I know you did it once. I don't know if you can do it again. Abraham knew you provided one son, you could do that again. You, you provided once before, you could do it again. I know it's weird because it's a son and you can't replace it. But, but you understand the principle that God was trying to reiterate in the Word that God said, I provided you with a son, but I provided you with seed. Would you bring your seed and apply the principle and watch what I will do? And he says to his son, son, don't worry, God will provide. God will provide. And right at the last minute, he did. Why? Because Abraham lived by the principle. He lived by the principle that if I take my seed, my seed will stay limited. But God wasn't calling Abraham to be a father. 
He was calling him to be a father of many nations. So it couldn't stop at one son or just some seed. It had to go beyond one son to multiply, to multiply, to multiply. It would have stayed dormant as one seed. But as he began to sow the seed by principle, it actually produced the multiplication that God had intended. God's good on His promise. But are we great in the principle? God's looking for participant. You want to know the plan of God? Let me make it as plain as possible. God's plan is your participation. God's plan is your participation. God's plan is that He would not just do for you, but He would bring you in and say, let's do this together. Watch what we're gonna do together. You know how this is gonna roll? I'm gonna give you the seed and you're gonna sow the seed. And what you're gonna see through sowing the seed is the multiplied effect of what I gave you as I put my power in your hands and you could be part of the journey. Then you don't just sit there and go, wow, God provided for me. There's no revelation like the fact that God works through me. Something powerful when you realize, God, you chose me and you called me and you want to flow through me. God, you are, you are magnificent. You're a mighty God. But that's the plan that you would participate, that you would participate, that you would take the principles of God and you would apply them to your life.